My name is Birgit Hani. I'm from Azin, which is an accreditation agency um, that is based in Germany but operates internationally and we focus on certification, certification systems, accreditation, f especially in the fields of engineering, technology, informatics, um, interdisciplinary subjects there, uh, so bis uh, business informatics, for example, information systems, um, and in the fields of natural sciences. And we have also a branch that operates in consulting and organization building in higher education in general. And in this project, I'm part of the core team, um, of the guide core team, that a project that was mentioned by Werner. And uh, well, together with all other colleagues, we tried to bring in expertise on quality, on the quality dimension of e-leadership education, basically, and on the question how to make transparent what is going on with regard to e-leadership education. And therefore, my, my duty today is to, to show you what has been developed in terms of tools and instruments in this project. And so, my topics are these curriculum profiles that have been mentioned by Werner, by Paul already, the curriculum profiles is the tool that I'm going to present you here. So the question, I would like to answer the question, why are the, these curriculum profiles important? What is a curriculum profile in the end? We are talking about all day long now. And how do they work in practice? So we have, what information do we have so far from the presentations of this day, from the discussions before lunchtime? We seem to agree <laughs> that any kind of organization of industry in the public and the private sector all over Europe should have access to e-leadership skills, to the e-leadership skills the specific organization needs now and in future. We know that at the moment being some companies know already what they are going to need in future in terms of leadership skills. A lot of them do not even know it yet. We know so far that there is a certain offer regarding e-leadership education at academic level in Europe, but it's not so many offers that have been found all over Europe. So they, and we know it's another, it's another factor we already know now, by now, that education institutions, business schools, university, universities take some time. It takes several years before when they start programs to get an effect, to get the people out into the market. So we have also a kind of a, of a, of a time lag there. And therefore, we have got this gap we have to, uh, got a gap in time. We know that we will need e-leadership in future for having innovation capacity in Europe in all kind of public and private sectors. And we need to close this gap somehow. And that's exactly what we try to do in this project. We, we try to close this gap. And that's, imagine, um, a practitioner that even nowadays has recognized the importance of getting in e-leadership skills into the company. And imagine a university teacher getting out of this room and saying, yes, I want to educate e-leaders for the future of Europe. And both of them need information. The, other, the one needs information what the other side asks for, is going to need in the future, and the other side needs to know what is going to be offered, and if it's exactly the skills that they are going to need in future. So the curriculum profiles we offer as a tool are basically a, a transportation, they transport information on the needs from the other, from the one box to the other box. 
And the challenge in this regard is that people do not know each other. Because if they knew each other, we would not have to offer them a tool. So it's the tools that we offer in the, in the project or in this initiative. It's the curriculum profiles that are the core element. And around these curriculum profiles, we have got some more elements, which is quality criteria and which is stakeholder interaction channels. But the core element is curriculum profiles, and that's what I'm going to tell you about. So the big challenge, I've said it, is to connect people that do not know each other and that do not have a communication channel already. Therefore, the main function of this whole discussion, what we do, is to create transparency, to let people know what is out there in terms of offers, of education offers. If a specific training is offered already out there, if skills can be gained in a certain university environment that my own company is going to need. The next function we try to cover with this tool is to make comparable what is offered and what is needed. Because as we have, have heard today, this is not just a question of finding one solution in terms of one education program that would fit all over Europe and would feel all fit all different needs all over Europe. It has also to do with respecting or with, with finding answers and solutions for specific sectors, for specific branches, for specific regions, for internationally operating, for bigger, smaller companies and organizations, for public or private operating, depends on the financing models, whatever. So it's not a one-fits-it-all solution that will be created out there by universities. Therefore, we need a tool making comparable in terms of skills that are gained in single different programs. <laughs> and with this, with this, there should at least be created the, the grounds, the basis for gaining, for creating trust, for, gain, for, for offering trustful solutions in higher education, in professional education or executive ed education as you call it here. So that trust can be built into uh, certificates, uh, into the skills that are gained in education. So far, I think Paul has mentioned it already, three curriculum profiles have been defined. So we have got a little portfolio that is already offered. And this is business and enterprise architecture. You have been discussing it before lunch, the importance of having someone in the company that knows the big picture. And that is a permanent, permanent staff members and not just bought in as a consultant. It's um, a, a, a curriculum profile um, named Innovation and Transformation through ICT. Paul, would you like to jump in here and to give a, a short reason why exactly this curriculum profile has been agreed on? It, it does make the assumption that the, the CIO, because of the, the association I work with, would be the driver of innovation and transformation. Now, I think that was a little bit... Um, arrogance is not the right word, but I think quite often someone at sea level in the organisation can be the one who is actually driving that transformation. So while I, I said that yes, it, it is very much a, a CIO type of curriculum profile, it's aimed at whoever in the organisation is the driver of innovation, is the driver of transformation. So I think yes, a lot of our CIOs would aspire to be and, and would like to think of themselves in that role, but it's, it's, the, it's the curriculum profile for the the, the real um, innovation driver within your organisation. Probably C-level. Um, yes, it'd be nice if it was the CIO, but we're not saying it would just be that one. So, yeah, with, with your description, I hope you get a little bit the feeling of what, what these curriculum profiles um, are about. So, there, there is three at the moment, and each of these three describes the specific skills, the specific learning outcomes in terms of knowledge, skills, competences that are needed for, yeah, it's not, it's not rather roles, but it's, it's functions, basic functions in e-leadership, if you want so, in companies. 
The third one was information security governance. It might not be necessary to discuss why information security governance is one of the three that has been chosen to be defined as one of the first. In the portfolio, it's kind of public awareness that uh, arose all over the world over the last year. So and these three curriculum profiles were endorsed by EuroCIO as being the three to start a portfolio with, and therefore I have asked Paul to describe a little bit why one of them was decided, the ICT profile was decided to be presented. And what is important is that they all focus on learning outcomes and competences. So they do not tell higher education institutions how to uh, drive to Rome, but that to drive to Rome. So the, the solution itself has to be created, um, yeah, created by the higher education itself, higher education institution or the business schools. But it, 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 so it, it states where to go in terms of learning outcomes and objectives. A skills profile is described. Um, for the, the ones of you that know the e-competence framework, the, the skills that are described in the e-competence framework and that fit with the area that is covered in one of the curriculum profiles have been matched. So they, they, they match, they, they, they have been used. The e-competence framework has also been used for describing this specific e-leadership um, learning outcomes settings. So what does a curriculum profile look like? It is a structured document. It has got a kind of a table format. It has got a title. It has got a rationale in it, so it explains what the reason behind this specific curriculum profile is. It contains sample, sample roles, what Paul has been describing for the innovation one. It contains the learning outcomes, which is the, the core part, the central part of it. It contains uh, core content example, learning experience examples, and competence and understanding mapping towards the ECF. So that's what a profile of a curriculum looks like that is presented. The intention is using these profiles and publishing them and giving them to schools, um, to business schools, universities, and offering them also to HR persons, to, to responsibles in companies and, and public organization, is to inspire at one side, at the supply side, the development of new programs, but also to inspire the, the redesign of existing ones. Um, and to, to make transparent to, to employers what they can expect from a certain program when they send people to it, for example. And in order to make this comparison between a single program and a curriculum profile, we have developed uh, an automatic questionnaire. We call it assessment tool. <laughs> so a questionnaire tool that can be used, and it's uh, Sean Manwani and uh, Achilles Georgiou that are going to present their experiences in using this assessment tool, comparing their specific programs against the curriculum profile immediately after me. So they will be able to, to report their experience on this. So the results of these assessments can be shared. There is several other higher education institution business schools that are invited to join this exercise. And the idea is that the results of this internal assessment are published onto a website in a kind of register. And with this, in a, several programs are presented publicly in a structured and comparable way. And based on this registration publication, one can stop there. But there is also the possibility, at least in the design of our initiative, there is the possibility that a third party assessment can be added to this internal assessment. And there you would have external peers, what you know from accreditation certification, what you know in industry from ISO uh, auditing and whatever. There you can have external auditors that, that check basically that assessor program and there you would have an independent 
judgment onto a program, and all this can be published as well. And uh, finally, with the independent assessment, you would also be able to gain a quality label. So this is the, the design around the curriculum profiles, if you want. So curriculum profiles are used as, as benchmark tools in order to, to gain uh, information about the quality and about the skills that are offered in, in higher education or in, in professional or executive education in terms of e-leadership education. So there is different assessments that have taken place already uh, in nine, it, it, several schools in spread in nine countries have already participated, have played a little bit with the tool. And we are going to see the so two examples today, as I have mentioned. And uh, while well, this, this is still open, so every school that has got the impression, yes, we have got a program or we have got a training that we offer that could fit with one of the three curriculum profiles that are uh, presented uh, by the initiative so far, are of course, is of course invited to join and to play with the assessment tool as well. So this is uh, what is the status quo. And next, what is developed so far in, in this uh, initiative, it's curriculum profiles, we have been discussing it, and a quality criteria that are around the curriculum profiles is the assessment process and assessment tool and what is built, what is being built uh, at the moment or these days, during these days, is the online register, is the, the, the web presentation of the tools, uh, of the instruments and, 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 the, and the reports um, created upon the assessment and online feedback ch channels shall be added as well. Okay, um, with these tools we hope to offer pathways through the jungle and we hope to offer a strong communication tool between demand side and supply side in order to support the development of more and effective e-leadership e education all over Europe. As I said, the initiative is still open until the end of this year, even uh, some weeks longer probably. <coughs> it's open to education institutions, to employers that want to comment onto the curriculum profiles because we have had already the one and the other uh, event like this and there were employers, there were also university representatives telling us, listen, I think you need another curriculum profile. It's not enough with the three. So also this kind of, of input is very, very much welcome. And Paul will take note. <laughs> and uh, so please send a notification of interest if you are interested in. Thank you for your patience, for your interest. And yeah, good discussions. OK, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, delighted to be here in Budapest, which is actually my third visit. Um, in my first visit, I was wearing a particular hat of, uh, of the demand side. So when we looked at the, uh, the ecosystem and uh, we saw the demand side and the supply side and the intermediate side, then I was wearing the demand side as a European CIO of uh, Diageo, which is the largest drinks company in the world. And I met with the Hungarian IT director and we had a, some really good meetings about how we could develop new applications, new systems, new business processes in, in Hungary. And then in my uh, second visit was uh, eight years ago. Um, when I was a European CIO, I did my MBA at Henley. So again, the demand side of education. And then on my second visit, I was actually now teaching on the MBA program. And I had 100 people from IBM. Um, interesting organization, of course, IBM. I think we, do we have the uh, representative from IBM today? Yes. <laughs> so it, it, IBM, uh, of course, if you try and teach information management to IBM, uh, they somehow think they know quite a lot about this topic. And uh, some of our academic, uh, my academic colleagues were rather fearful, really, of, of do, doing this uh, topic. I mean, fortunately, as a a European CIO, I'd worked with IBM and so it was a little bit uh, easier. But So this was a, a second visit on the supply side 
And on this particular occasion, of course, it's representing demand, supply, and the intermediate position that Birgit uh, described. So one of the things I see in e-leadership, of course, is that um, things don't always go right. So this presentation has already changed from the one that uh, we loaded earlier. Uh, it's a slightly different presentation than the one we loaded earlier. Maybe it's a previous one, but never mind. I, I will adjust <laughs> and adapt as an e-leader needs to do and I will work with this, uh, this other presentation. So here's what we're gonna cover. We're gonna look at um, essentially the why and what of e-leadership. Mostly on the what, because I think we've heard a lot about why e-leadership. And I wanna reinforce what Birgit's been talking about with the curriculum profiles by focusing in specifically on business enterprise architecture. Now that sounds like quite a long convoluted title, but really it's about how do you design a business? And who is responsible for designing a business? Well, I have a very simple message when I go to talk to organizations. If the CEO does not delegate that responsibility, then the CEO is the business architect. So that's the message when we go out, whether we're a CIO, a chief digital officer, whatever, we should be working with the CEO and saying, what, how do you want to design your organization? How can I help you do that? And then finally, I want to finish really with some lessons for stakeholders. So we know this, if organizations can't transform their business models, they can't survive. Why do we know that? Because we see lots of organizations that failed. And I've seen some of those organizations in my experience as a professor, as a consultant. Uh, fortunately, as a, uh, when I was working for organizations, uh, they actually survived rather than failed. So you get to see what, why it works and why it doesn't work. And one of the things, the messages I would have for any CIO is never do an IT transformation. Now that might seem a bit bizarre. Why would you say to a CIO, never do an IT transformation? The reason is that IT transformations take a long time. They're complex, they're costly. What happens during that period? The business changes. The business model changes, the operating model changes. So one thing I learned from my experience is that Diageo and Electrolux is always connect the IT transformation to a business transformation. But to do that makes it very difficult. And that's why these ET leaders are hard to find. Now, all the surveys say that there's lots of them fail. We have one uh, here, 72% of organizations fail to transform. And I would argue the reason that they fail to do so is because e-leadership is so difficult. Whether you describe it as a three-legged beast, I can't quite get my head around that image. Uh, the, the fact is, combining the digital business opportunity with what's happening in terms of the, the business opportunity and then linking that through and having the leadership skills is very difficult. And it's particularly difficult because of stakeholders. And stakeholders, of course, also apply in this e-leadership education system. And, and, and I, I think we'll touch on those three as we go through. What about Henley? Um, Henley is a beautiful business school in a lovely location by the River Thames. It's the home of the uh, Henley Regatta, some of you may know about. And uh, it's one of the reasons why I trans transferred from academia, or transferred from, uh, from being a CIO to academia, is, is because of uh, this wonderful location. We have a strong heritage in, uh, in e-leadership. We didn't call it e-leadership, but in terms of what we called our hybrid MBA program, which is business and IT, that was 20 years ago. We have a lot, do a lot on strate strategic change leadership and we embed and transfer uh, e-learning. So we're very much about combining theory and practice. Earlier, someone said about emotional intelligence. How do you measure that? Well, we had a professor who actually specialized in emotional intelligence and developed instruments for that. One of the things he said is to get into an organization, you need a high IQ. To succeed in an organization and get to a certain level, you need a high MQ, management quotient. But if you want to get to the top of an organization, you need a high EQ. And they did this analysis quite successfully in showing this relationship. And I think it's summed up very nicely by this quote. To think is easy, to act is hard, but the hardest thing in the world is to act in accordance with your thinking. So that idea of practice and theory. 
I would only modify it a, a little bit uh, and to say that uh, I don't think to, it's actually easy. I think it's not very easy. And actually, theory, good theory, is hard and it's very powerful. So let me tell you just about some of the programs we've been developing over the last seven years at, uh, at Henley. And uh, the first one was a corporate program. It was a master's program that was de developed specifically for one organization. That organization was Deutsche Telekom. And they came to us and they said, we want an e-leadership program. They didn't call it e-leadership, but that's what it was. And what we developed with them was an end-to-end -end program from strategy at one end all the way through to benefits realization. And they sent 40 people on that program. That's a pretty big investment. Of course, in the context of an organization that had a multi-billion euro IT budget and several thousand IT people, it was really less than their stationary budget. But for any of us, it's a lot. But they recognized that in order to do real transformation, they needed to build capability. And those 40 people completed the program, and they then sent another 49 people on the second cohort. So that gives you an idea of the commitment that some organizations will make if they see the benefit of e-leadership. Next, we had a consultancy who uh, approached us, and they said, we want to bring together our business consultants and our IT consultants. Interesting, isn't it? We all struggle in organizations to bring together business and IT, and the consultancy had the same challenge. They have sent over 175 people through this Henley program, and basically they connect the business and IT to create e-leaders. And these are not junior people, these are partner levels, senior consultants, and it costs them a lot of money. Not just the money for us, but all the lost utilization. And the reason they're doing, they actually track the benefits. And they say as a result of this program, they are generating multi-million pounds worth of benefits in terms of new, new uh, assignments. So clearly we're seeing it with working with a corporate, we're seeing work with a consultancy, and by the way, I think you'll notice that both of those were very much collaborative. It's not us as Henley saying that we have all the answers, because we don't. It's the collaboration. And again, the collaboration, as, as Werner described earlier, and as Paul described and Birgit, so this European Business Enterprise Architecture Program, a unique collaboration, really, of multiple business schools, working together to create this program, is the one that uh, I now want to focus on. The curriculum profile, I think it's worth just focusing on what actually are the contents of a curriculum profile. And I'm gonna pick on three things. The first thing I wanna pick up on is the learning outcomes. What is it as a result of doing on this program and going on this program that we expect the participants to be able to, to do? What we expect them to do is actually design businesses and to be really innovative about how they create new business and operating models. We expect them to understand what's happening with that digital world that was so ably described by Martin earlier in terms of all of the new technologies, to understand those opportunities. And we expect them then to drive the change. It's no, no use just having a great design. How do you translate that design into real business performance? And then how do you deal with, bearing in mind most of the companies that come on our program pretty large companies. How do you deal with all the different stakeholders across different boundaries? So it's a big, it's a big challenge. And ultimately, if you're an e-leader, you've also got to be able to develop other e-leaders, and you've got to build that architectural capability. So this is a challenge. This is not easy work. And it's, this is why it's an 18-month program over nine modules, which is similar, by the way, to the Deutsche Telekom. Again, 18 months over nine programs. It's not something you teach in two weeks. But equally, it's not something you can do in 18 months with someone who's just come out of university. If you walk out of university and think, I'm going to be an e-leader in 18 months by attending one of these programs, I'm sorry, you've got another thing coming. So we are very much into experienced people. The program we start, as Paul said, um, next, uh, next, in a couple of weeks' time, we have people who have typically 10 to 15 years' experience. Already, they are already successful enterprise architects in their organizations. So why are they coming on a program like ours? 
it's because to make that jump to be an e-leader is still a big jump to do the learning outcomes we've got there. So essentially, the learning experience is absolutely critical. And it is that combination I described earlier of combining theory and practice and setting that within an organizational context. And of course, it's very much about providing an opportunity for the participants, not only to learn from us, but to share the experience insight. So we act as that role of a facilitator. And yes, as a CIO, sometimes I wore the hat of facilitator. Sometimes I was a dictator, but hey, you've got to wear different hats for different purposes. But in this program here, we do act very much as a facilitator. As, um, as Birgit said, the European Competency Framework, which is a great framework, free of charge, you can log on and you've got access to all these wonderful definitions of skills. Everyone should, should do that. What we do in, in the curriculum profile is we define which skills are critical for this curriculum profile of a business architect and enterprise architect. And here you can see what we consider the core skills and the level at which they're required. And these levels come from the European Competency Framework. As you'd expect, architecture design is level five, and that is the core of it. But equally, someone said earlier about program management, portfolio management being key. We absolutely agree with you. It's, it's vital. So is the alignment of the business strategy. So is the business change management. And so is the understanding of technology and exploring new technologies. Alongside that, you need a whole set of other competencies in order to drive through the sourcing, the service management, the procurement, etc., All of these things are necessary as well. And as you'll see from this program, the core modules of business enterprise architecture are the middle layer, the EA specialisms, but we also have drivers of business enterprise architecture. So some of you may be familiar with business IT partners. Have you come across that term? Relationship managers, yeah? These are the people who sit there and act as counsellors between the business people and IT people who can't talk to each other. Well, one would hope they're not necessary so much in the future, but, but the, these people are the ones who have to translate the strategy business to IT. They're the ones that have to translate the demand management into requirements. They're the ones that have to manage these change programs and ensure change management is in place. These are the three modules we run at Henley. The three modules on enterprise architecture our wonderful colleagues in Munich, Technical University in Munich, do those. And the ones from TS Nimbus are really very much the enablers of enterprise architecture. So the, the governance, the sourcing, and, uh, and of course the execution. So what we did, um, we took that program and we mapped it back to the curriculum profile. Now, they're both called business enterprise architecture, so you won't be surprised that there was a pretty high map and a pretty high um, and consistency and compliance to that. However, the good thing is we really learned something from doing that mapping process. And one of the things we learned is that we, hadn't, we didn't do enough on the technology side. We hadn't really taken on board all of the new emerging technologies and how that could transform uh, you know, the business models, operating models. So in the, in the module that we have in, in a couple of weeks' time, that's going to be a strong positioning. I've got a guy from McKinsey who's coming to talk about digital architecture. I have someone who's a director of strategy and change for a digital company who's going to be doing something on emerging technologies. And we've added those things in explicitly because of our mapping to the curriculum profile. And we've also recognised that in other areas like the business plan development, we need to be stronger and coordinated so that there's a consistent message. So, in summary, what would I say the lessons are? Um, hopefully, for each of you, you see yourself in one or more of these three uh, roles, that you're either on the demand side saying, give me e-leadership education, you're on the supply side saying, hey, we do this stuff, or you're somewhere in the middle facilitating uh, the demand supply side coming together. My message to you is, take a look at the curriculum profiles. They are very useful in terms of getting to a first, first stage for the demand people to say, what do I want from a, a program? When Deutsche Telekom came to us and they said, look, we have an idea of what we want, and then we shaped it with them. This gives you that starting point. Instead of you having to work it through, here's a starting point. Don't accept it necessarily as being gospel. Challenge it. Come back. Let Werner know. Let Paul know and say, you know, 
we think it also needs to be this or should be included there. I'm not sure if you'll thank me for that, Werner, but I would say challenge it. Challenge the, demand pro challenge the curriculum profiles from a demand perspective. On, your, on the supply side, great starting point. If you're designing a new program, you can also take a look at it. If you've already got an existing program, you can do as Birgit described, you can use the assessment tool to match and see how well you perform. You may come back and say, actually, from the supply side, we think we need, need a new curriculum profile. We're doing things out there, there's a market for it, but you haven't got it captured yet. So again, there's an opportunity there. And for those of you that are working to bring together demand supply side, again, looking at those curriculum profiles is a great way to see if there's a connect. Am I able to connect, connect the demand and supply side? So I hope um, this short session gives you some insights into the experiences we've had at uh, Henley and, and what we've learnt from doing this and what I've personally learnt. Thank you again for this opportunity uh, to present you. I've enjoyed it and it's uh, been great to listen to all the sessions. If you need to get hold of me, that's where I am. Thank you. Let me start with a personal story. A uh, few months ago there was an uh, event in kindergarten and uh, I said I will be a fa father who will not take videos with phones and iPads and things and sit, sit down and enjoy. I saw so many people hanging cameras around. After the event, I went and asked them to give me a copy of the, to send me a copy, send me, give me, send me. And after three months, I got a copy of the e event. I don't know. <laughs> It was not easy to explain to my kid what is this. So because uh, uh, things have changed. That's, uh, let's start from here. In the last 10 years, so many things have changed. Let me show you another picture. I'm sure you have seen this. It's quite an old picture, but let me ask you one question. What's the main thing that you think it has changed during the last 10 years? OK, one point. Integration, yeah. What else? Yeah. Size. Size. So all of these things you see there can fit in my pocket here or even more than what you see. The other important thing is what? You didn't mention the most important thing. Some of my students might know. All the things you see in the picture, everything, is now, today, has been digitalized. So nothing is analog anymore. Everything, even the money in his pocket, you don't see the wallet, but the money he has in his pocket is also digitalized. So that's what has changed during the last 10 years. It's the first time in history when, let's say, the academic world is kind of behind of how the evolution has gone. So things we use at, for fun at home, smartphones and uh, smart equipments, I'm sure you all have smart things, something with you, has now been moving towards the our business environment, bring your own device, they'll say. And earlier it was I had a new nice laptop and I took it home and everybody was says, wow. And I take my computer from IBM at home and they say, everybody say, wow. <laughs> so it's a, there is a big slight difference in the, during the last 10 years. Let's see what has changed. The new era, which uh, EDC, the, you have also presented in the beginning, that there are some emerging technologies, like mobile cloud, social, and Internet of Things, that have come around. But what is around of that is big data, and I have Norbert, my colleague here, who can explain, uh, talk about two days only about big data. But big data is like an umbrella over of those new emerging technologies. We can say data has become the new natural resource, and technology is the, one, the, the way how we can leverage that. That's why we could say that technology is so important nowadays for everyday business. And why the impact of this is so huge, I believe it's because of the uh, uh, joint uh, outcome of these emerging technologies. None of the technologies is questionable anymore. We can all accept and know what is cloud. We all know what is social, mobile, and Internet of Things. But the correlation and the co imp uh, cooperative impact of those will have a huge uh, impact also in the business in the future. We are not yet there. We are yet ma maximum here at this point of time. So the person I believe 
we are in a very early stage, and definitely we will still have a long journey in front of us. Let's see some more uh, examples. You have already mentioned that technology has become the number one external impact factor for business. There is no business without technology anymore. So even a bakery has to have IT to run to make properly the baker every day. <clears throat> technology is the number one external impact factor based on the outcome of the series of CIO studies. And not only on the CEO studies, but all, all C-level people do believe and share the same opinion. So that's why we have uh, given this as a, as a wording to our program that we would like to help our students to turn technology into business advantage, to be able to survive in this complex environment and to be those who are boosting up the, uh, the business uh, for, of their organization. Some uh, slight input, inputs about this. As Werner said, we are one of the programs which is during the assessment. I think we are in, not in the red stage, but maybe a higher level already. But I, I will give you some insights how I, when I did the assessment in the summer, how I, I, I saw it. Uh, our main message and objective is to help our students establishing a bridge between IT and technology. <coughs> Technology is not a black box anymore. It can be opened. If you see the half of the CIOs I know are financial people. Even Ferenc Alfredi, Alfredi who was presenting, he's pure finance guy. He has no technology background. I don't know our other CIO fellows who has IT background and who has finance background. But if you see half of them now, even nowadays, are pure finance people. Uh, Technology behind is not so difficult. So it's like, the, not the technology is a barrier of the evolution, but maybe the human aspect. We can say, for example, but you, I usually say that you can build a boat within a year. You have an intercontinental ship, you can build it within a year. That's the maximum time they get to build the boat. But to, to get the captain drive that boat or ship that boat, it needs, you need to teach him about 30 years to be able to sit in the, co in, in the cockpit. I don't know how you call it. So th that's a difficult thing, how to transform the so-called e-leaders. And since the time is not so long since this problem has raised a lot, the e-leaders, we have, you can see e-leaders only during the last 10 years or so. Let me give you some more uh, inputs about our program. We strongly believe that uh, it should, we should go top down. We are going top down and trying to be a ho in a holistic way and comp touching tools, processes, and people, all three aspects of how to be able to leverage technology. As because this is like a life cycle that processes are followed by people, those people who are using the tools, which tools are automating the processes. So this is a, a life cycle, and you have to have all three aspects in place balanced out. <clears throat> Another important thing is uh, when I say balance, it's, I always try to use this balance in different aspects. And also for our program, we have defined some balances. First balance is academic word with the business world. We try to find a healthy balance between the two by having great academic people teaching in the program and the top of the business people also coming as adjunct teachers or guests, lecturers or guest speakers or even participants in a role play, because we have, we, we strongly believe in act, active-based learning. I have some students who can ensure this, that it was good feeling to have role play situations, real life situations brought into the class and giving them more uh, energy to go out uh, later in the, in, the, in the field. Another balance is to find the balance, healthy balance between technology and business. This is already, I mentioned you. The program is local and global. It means that we have healthy level of people coming from the lo local market, but uh, since the CU attract, uh, it's the attractiveness of uh, the business school, it's a global. Usually, we have students from all over the world. I have Nizar here, who I don't know, you came from quite far away, and we had students who were coming from more than 5,000 kilometers to the school just to learn here. We try to, to use this mixture of students because it's so very good also to, to get soft skills, to learn how to communicate with different cultures, with different people, 
always in the, in the, the language of technology and around technology. And we also try to find, find a good balanced result and we, we work closely how to establish a good connection between the IT management uh, program and the MBA program, even by mixing our, our students or, or co-delivering co some uh, programs in order for them to get connections outside of the IT, let's say, <coughs> environment to get connections also from the MBA students and back and forward. It's very important that even nowadays in uh, our students, half of the students are coming from financial background without having any technology background from previous. That's, I think, very important and I'm very happy to say that, that people are, come, are very interested in learning how to open the black box of technology even though that they don't see all the insights uh, uh, from previous. So let me tell you some words about the mapping. Norbert, Norbert is writing. You have heard previously of the three uh, profiles. We, we have done the assessment uh, compared to the first one, and I think that's the one we are targeting, and I think we have done very close to the outcome, expected outcome. Uh, <coughs> The core content of the assessment, we can, we can say we are fully aligned with that. All the major uh, sayings and uh, implications are exactly the same as are in our program. Before I, we did the assessment, I was very curious to see, so something we have developed based on local and regional feedback from teachers, from students, from uh, our uh, business partners, and we have transformed the, com the program two years ago. How close it could get to the uh, profile, and I think we are very much aligned to what the profile uh, defines or, or says so. We might have some minor, minor deviations in the, some of the competencies H here, architectural design or like uh, risk management and pur purchasing. I could say the, those for uh, the first three, first top part was not our primary objective, and I'm still very, very skeptic whether we should go more deeper in this area or not. I don't want to lose those students who are coming from business side if, if this gets too much techy, let's say. So that's why I'm still thinking and we think with, with our teachers together how deep we should go in that direction. Do we need to go deeper than we are or, or is it enough for us even if we are not fully aligned with the profile? I believe this, there can be a small deviation uh, to keep it on the level where we are at this moment. That's a thing we have not decided yet, but I'm already also interested in your opinion. Do people need to get deeper than, although that you don't know the program detaily, some of you know, but uh, do we know, need to go in architectural design and very, very uh, deeply in the, uh, this area? And uh, there are some areas which we have started thinking of and looking for how to develop new curriculum uh, and to introduce it into the program, areas which we strongly believe are also <coughs> needed. And do we also have added to the program, to the profile, some uh, competencies we, we believe are needed for to become a good e-leader, like service level management and even sales management, we have auto here, so this was a very welcome from the students, how to sell, because even e-leaders have to sell their ideas, their uh, innovations, their thoughts, their needs. It's not like earlier they can, uh, technology managers, they get budget and you can spend as much as you want. Nowadays, the budget is almost equal to zero and everything has to be sold, even internally in within the organization. Um, regarding the comp uh, components where we have to map, I think we have a healthy spread. We have some... Uh, courses like IT for managers, this is also delivered for MBA students. This is like an umbrella course which gives the highlights of the whole program give, by giving uh, bird view insights to, to the MBA students. They don't need more, but for them it's also important to get some insights of how to use the technology and can give a very good uh, insight or uh, initial picture for the students or in, who are participating in the program. And all the other pr uh, uh, classes, courses we have, are covering more or less all of the competences which are defined by the profile. So I'm 
really happy. And we can see some which we might be a bit uh, different, going to a different direction, but um, we will revise and think how and why it kind of match could be there. If you have questions, just stop me, but I have a picture for you. So we, we would like, if uh, Ferenc talked about Zoom uh, today, but it's not the same who, who is who. We, are, we help our students becoming so brave that they can get in front of even the champion uh, from Hawaii, uh, Sumo guy. Before I stop and finish, I have some other news for you from maybe more, some already know. <coughs> that we, can, we go even further. So we, we believe there is something even more out there. I talked about big data. It's like big data nowadays is if you try with this glass to drink from this type of uh, uh, fire plant. So I, I think that's kind of impossible thing. This is the moment of time nowadays that people and organization trying to get something out of data which is floating. I think, I don't know if you are Hungarians, you have seen the recent news that there is an innovation in this field that you can prepare a small uh, tool which can help you drink from this fire plant. That's for fun, but the reality, the story which I would like to tell you is that we are uh, in the final stage of getting accredited a new MSc program, which will be an MSc program in business analytics around big data. This is kind of first such a program in, in Europe. And it's, a, it's a, not an easy job because we had to cooperate in within the university with different departments like economics, stati statistics, and management. That's also for those who are coming from the uh, academic field, they know that's a, not an easy job to be done. And also we have uh, worked co closely with uh, business partners like IBM and others who are helping us putting the new course, the new program together, which we start next year. So we are now in the accreditation phase uh, in, in the US. I hope this will attract different kind of people. I don't know if you have read, nowadays there is a saying that within two, three years from now, in East Seal Board of Directors, there will be a so-called Chief Data Officer. That's a new role somebody who is helping, not from technological aspect, but just from that aspect, how to do something for, for their business. That's which we are also very eager to see how it evolves. And this goes parallel to the MSc in IT program, which is, has the scope a bit uh, different, not over, but same, have some slightly overlappings, but it's a bit uh, different. Uh, that's what I would like to tell you, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you.